Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is a chart that we don't look at very often. This is a, the monthly chart of the Dow Jones Utility Index. And this is an important index because it is a interest rate indicator. I'm going to read the entry from um, Investopedia explaining, actually this is from MoneyZine, and it ex explains what the utility average is. It, it's 15 companies uh, and their utility stocks, but the question is why is the utility average connected to interest rates, and this explains it. One of the reasons market analysts follow the Dow Jones utility so closely has to do with its perceived relationship to interest rates. According to the experts, that study the averages, a rise in utility stock prices means that investors are anticipating falling interest rates, while a decline in these stock prices means that interest rates are rising. There are two theories behind why this happens. The first has to do with the amount of borrowing or financial leverage that utilities use to support their capital investments. When interest rates are declining, the interest expense on that borrowing goes down and the profitability of utilities is enhanced. This makes these stocks more attractive to investors. The second theory that links the rise and fall of the utility average to interest rates has to do with typically high stock dividends that utilities pay. In fact, a study we conducted in 2011 found that 87% of the utility index stocks were paying dividends over 3.25% compared to just 23% of the industrial index. When interest rates are falling, the dividend yields of the utilities become more attractive to those investors seeking a steady source of income, thereby driving up the price of utility stocks. So basically what that's saying is that Low interest rates make it easier for utility companies to make capital expenditures by borrowing cheaply. I don't think that has anything to do with what we're seeing here. But the second reason is that uh, investors buy utility stocks when they believe that interest rates are going to fall because generally most of the utility stocks pay a, a dividend. Uh, I think 3.25 was what he quoted. I don't know what the average interest rate or dividend rate is on, on the Dow utilities, it's probably fairly low. But it's nothing like the 0.25% that the Fed uh, is giving us. So pulling back to the daily, this is a very interesting chart. We know that the Federal Reserve did its first interest rate increase in December of last year. And you can see here on this chart that that was roughly right in here. It actually coincides with a uh, sort of bottom in the utility index and then a rise into new highs. And we can see here on the monthly again that it's actually at all time highs. It's a big blue candlestick going straight up here. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that the market does not believe the Fed one bit because if the market believed the Fed in interest uh, the utility index would be falling now you can see that if we look in the past you can see the top that was put in the utilities back in 2001 at the beginning of the Fed's interest rate raising cycle uh, you can also see the same sort of thing here uh, that happened with the financial crisis but we we have new highs in the utility index that surpass those put in late 2014. So what does this mean? It means the market doesn't believe the Fed. And I don't believe the Fed either. Uh, I think the Fed is trapped. They can't raise interest rates. And probably the next move is going to be a drastic cut or some type of, type of quantitative easing. And that's what a lot of uh, alternative media pundits are predicting. But definitely the utilities index gives lie to the fact that the Fed is on some type of interest rate increasing cycle. Uh, the Fed is uh, they're stuck. They don't know what to do. 
So let's get to the main story of the night here. I want to talk about government dependency and how that fosters a system of uh, ultimately, you know, dependency and that's going to result in bankruptcy. And I want to read this article from Reason talking about Section 8. And Section 8 was traditionally actually a system where the government would provide housing directly. So you had those very famous uh, housing developments. You had Cabrini Green and many, many others, which were actually government-built housing projects. They were very, very large, high-rise government housing projects. And, of course, they became magnets for crime and gangs and ultimately had to be shut down. They became places where the police were actually afraid to go. Uh, they were war zones, and we know that everything the government touches uh, is completely destroyed, whether that's education, medicine, anything you can name. If the government's involved, it will be destroyed and result in just horrible outcomes. But I'm going to read you this article from Reason, and then we're going to go to a post of someone who has uh, basically... Uh, decided to, to follow the the common phrase, if you can't beat them, join them. So this is about mainly about Section 8 housing, but it, it really applies to almost all the benefits the government hands out. The Obama administration now proposes to spend millions more on handouts despite ample evidence of their perverse effects. Now, I was saying with the Section 8 housing and Cabrini Green and uh, these areas where the government actually created the housing, what happened was they switched from doing that because the results, of course, were disastrous, and they went to a voucher system where they decided instead of doing that, they would take the Section 8 people and give them money to rent. And what that does is if they put the rental subsidy high enough, then that allows Section 8 people to disperse out into the regular communities and be spread out evenly, more evenly amongst the population. And uh, that's part of what's being addressed in this article. So the Obama administration now proposes to spend millions more on handouts despite ample evidence of their perverse effects. Sean Donovan, Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, says... The single most important thing HUD does is provide rental assistance to America's most vulnerable families, and the Obama administration is proposing bold steps to meet their needs. They always propose bold steps. In this case, HUD wants to spend millions more to renew Section 8 housing vouchers that help poor people pay rent. Section 8 program, the Section 8 program ballooned during the 90s to solve a previous government failure, crime-ridden public housing. Rent vouchers allow the feds to disperse tenants from failed projects into private residences. There, poor people would learn good habits from middle class people. It was a reasonable idea, but as always, there were unintended consequences. On paper, Section 8 seems like it should be successful, says Donald Gobin, a Section 8 landlord in New Hampshire. But unless tenants have some unusual fire in their belly, the program hinders upward mobility. Gulbin complains that his tenants are allowed to use Section 8 subsidies for an unlimited amount of time. There is no work requirement. Recipients can become comfortably dependent on government assistance. In Gulbin's over 30 years of renting to Section 8 tenants, he has seen only one break free of the program. Most recipients stay on Section 8 their entire lives. They use it as a permanent crutch. Government's rules kill the incentive to succeed. Section 8 handouts are meant to be generous enough that tenants may afford a home defined by HUD as decent, safe, and sanitary. In its wisdom, the bureaucracy has ruled that decent, safe, and sanitary may require subsidies as high as $2,200 per month. And just let me give you as an FYI, my mortgage that I pay on my house is roughly $750 a month. So that ought to tell you how out of whack things are. But because of that, Section 8 tenants often get to live in nicer places than those who pay their own way. Kevin Spaulding is an MIT graduate in Boston 
who works long hours as an engineer and struggles to cover his rent and student loans. Yet all around him, he says, he sees people who don't work but live better than he does. Quote, it doesn't seem right, he says. I work very hard but can only afford a lower-end apartment. There are non-working people on my street who live in better places than I do because they're on Section 8. Spalding understands why his neighbors don't look for jobs. The subsidies are attractive. They cover 70 to 100% of rent and utilities. If Section 8 recipients accumulate money or start to make more, they lose their subsidy. Is there a real incentive for the tenants to go to work? No, says Gobin. They have a relatively nice house and do not have to pay for it. Once people are reliant on Section 8 assistance, many do everything in their power to keep it. Some game the system by working under the table so that they don't lose the subsidy. One of Gobin's lifetime Section 8 tenants started a cooking website. She made considerable money from it, so she went to great lengths to hide the site from her case manager, running it under a different name. Here's a lady that could definitely work. She actually showed me how to get benefits and play the system, says Gobin. Although Section 8 adds to our debt while encouraging people to stay dependent, it isn't going away. HUD says it will continue to make quality housing possible for every American. Despite $20 billion spent on the program last year, demand for more rental assistance remains strong. There's a long wait list to receive Section 8 housing in every state. In New York City alone, 120,000 families wait. Some are truly needy, but many recipients of income transfers are far from poor. America will soon be $17 trillion in debt, and our biggest federal expense is income transfers. They are justified on the grounds that some of that helps the needy, but we don't help the needy by encouraging dependency. Government grows, dependency grows. Now, you know that debt is now over $19 trillion. It's uh, $19.25 trillion. Uh, and this article was written in 2013. So I wanted to read to you a post. This actually came from Godlike Productions, and this is a gentleman who it's uh, sparked a very large controversy there. I'll link the original um, thread. But this is a person who has decided to um, game the system, we'll say. Uh, it's a person who has gotten so fed up with the way the system works that he decided to game it as best he could and uh, it has resulted in a lot of outrage uh, people being outraged by his actions and uh, criticizing him for what he's done uh, I'm not going to do that I this is not something that I would do and it's not something that I would recommend but the reason why I'm covering this is that it shows it's it's a symptom of a system that's collapsing of its own weight. And the analogy I've used many, many times is the analogy of uh, people pulling a cart and people riding in a cart. And you have a certain number of people pulling the cart and you have a certain number of people riding in the cart. Now, as the people who are pulling the cart realize that uh, they would rather be riding in the cart and they leave uh, the front of the line of the uh, wagon train and decide to jump in the cart then that means there's one less pulling and that's one more riding and uh, ultimately if that pattern continues then obviously the cart is going to grind to a halt and there won't be anybody pulling and it won't be going anywhere and this this post is important because it shows a person who is so fed up with the system, even though he's successful, he's decided to game the system by taking a drastic step of agreeing with his wife to get a divorce to game the system. So let me read this post. Uh, the title is, The wife and I quietly dissolved our marriage contract so she can collect subsidies while I work. Make no mistake, we are still very much in love and together. With the kids, though, she can't work. Not going to do the daycare route. Nothing worse for a kid. Since we were married and I earned too much, we couldn't get free food and housing like the degenerates who refused to get jobs. So here I was trying to support my family and paying high taxes to support someone else's laziness. So we divorced. Only on paper, though. 
then since she had no income of her own, she was able to apply for EBT, that's food stamps, and a housing allowance. We don't live in the ghetto with the rest of the proles. I rent a room to her under Section 8 stipulations. Now, we simply collect the taxes back that I pay out. I highly suggest you look into it. It is all perfectly legal and legit. Being married gets you punished and discriminated against by our system. Get rid of that stupid state marriage contract. It's only a piece of paper and the world opens up. The toughest part is explaining to the woman that it's just a piece of paper, that true marriage is an agreement of trust. Women have trouble letting go of the security blanket of the marriage contract since she won't be able to legally control you. But if she trusts you and your marriage is real, then she should have no problem shredding the document. I still own our home. I rent a room to her. It's legal. It is a legal rental agreement. And I provide just fine, but I didn't agree to provide for some, uh, I'm not going to this racist comment, in the ghetto who breeds with reckless abandon. I'm just taking back what is mine. I cleared $160,000 last year, but I paid $30,000 in taxes. Well, you could argue where this ta these tax dollars go. As long as the government is paying for some lazy degenerate to do nothing, I got to get mine too. As long as you have that state marriage contract, your wife is discriminated against by the government. Why should she be punished just because she is married? The easy solution is to get rid of the contract. Our marriage is between us and God, not with the state. Our parents don't even know we divorced. By all appearances, nobody would know any different. Still, where are rings and all that? Get rid of marriage contract and a whole new world of opportunity opens up for her. It's awesome. Free phones, free food, free housing, free education. Let me add, free utilities. Exactly. Now, someone uh, commended him and his reply was, exactly. The scammer here is the Marxist government. I've paid into the system for years just to have that money confiscated by some worthless dirtbag. I'm just collecting my investment back. I have the moral high ground here, but I can see the brainwashed fools are having difficulty adapting. Get the subsidies and live like a king right across the border in Mexico. So that's the original post. A lot of uh, comments on it, a lot of controversy, a lot of people calling him names. Uh, I'm not here to judge the guy one way or another. Um, it's definitely not something I would do. Uh, just because I don't believe a Christian is going to do that. But this is just to show you that this is how the system is breaking down. Uh, obviously, someone who makes $160,000 a year is someone who's pulling the cart. They're, he said, admittedly, he's paying in $30,000 worth of taxes. Um, but as we pointed out with that article, $2,200, you can get $2,200 in uh, just the rent subsidy alone. So he can get virtually all of his taxes back by just simply uh, letting his wife be quote unquote divorced and collecting all the subsidies that the government pays for her to be a single mother. So what's the upshot of all this? And by the way, uh, someone said, uh, a, cri a critic of what he said he did, said, no, I know you're lying because the government doesn't let you rent a room um, using Section 8 vouchers. And his reply was, actually, we have a guest house on our property. And I simply list the guest house as the Section 8 um, residence. And then I rent that residence uh, guest residence to my wife collect the Section 8 voucher. So I, I believe this is a real post and the the most important takeaway from this is that uh, this is someone, this, this person is one of the strongest horses or mules or whatever you want to call them pulling the cart and he is absolutely stopping and getting in the cart. Now it doesn't take a lot of this type of behavior to collapse the system. 
obviously if everyone is in the cart and no one's pulling then we're not going anywhere so this this is coming very rapidly uh, it, it's not too far off in my opinion when this system of dependence collapses now even if you're a, a rebel like this guy and you decide to get in on the gravy train and uh, you know subsidize your lifestyle with this uh, perverse incentive from the government to um, not be married uh, you have to recognize that we're very late in this game and the people who are going to lose the most are going to be the people who are the most dependent on the government so uh, for those people who decide to game the system I'm not going to be one of them but if you are one of them then you better make sure that that percentage that you're getting from your gaming is a very, very low percentage and that you don't offset that to become dependent uh, because if you do then when this is cut off and ultimately this will be cut off it's impossible for everybody to collect benefits from the government that doesn't even make any sense um, so it will collapse of its own weight um, and if it collapses when you are receiving a significant amount of benefits out of it obviously that's going to impact you so if you're doing that you need to recognize it's going to be something temporary it's going to be taken away and uh, ultimately the, the entire system is going to reset and uh, there will not be the type of dependency that uh, they're fostering right now and we'll talk to you next time